If you're like me, you like to read books, but you're too busy with everything else that life throws at you. Audible.com is a great solution because they read them to you. Yes, that's right. With Audible, you can listen to books while you're doing other things. This is multitasking at its finest, people. Go out to audibletrial.com slash humanfactorscast to get a free trial and support your favorite podcast for new customers. They'll give you two new books to start out with, and after that, you get one audiobook a month for only 15 bucks. That's less than you would have spent for a full copy of an audiobook normally. Here's the best part. You get a 30% discount on additional audiobook purchases, and you can cancel your subscription at any time, but those books are yours to keep. Go to audibletrial.com slash humanfactorscast to start your free trial. That's audibletrial.com slash humanfactorscast, and let them know that Nick sent you. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. Billy Hall is not here today. He had something come up. So it's just me holding down the fort, but I couldn't do it alone. With me today, I have Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, so good to be here, Nick. How's your Monday been? Oh, it's a Monday. It's a Monday. Yep. How how was your Thanksgiving? Well, it's kind of a bummer. So I was supposed to travel out of town, but I ended up getting pretty sick the night before and it oh, no. didn't go anywhere. Well, So I, it was kind of restful, <laughs> which was super nice, but I missed hanging out with family and all that kind of good stuff. How about you, you? Well, I mean, I hope at least that means that you didn't have to talk politics at the table. Oh, I didn't talk politics at any table. <laughs> there you go. Did you keep, did you keep a journal of how thankful you were that you didn't have to talk politics? I <laughs> certainly did. I wrote it <laughs> ten times. There you go. Uh, my Thanksgiving was good. Uh, I went out to Arizona uh, and spent the uh, weekend, I guess, with uh, my girlfriend's uh, family. Sweet. Yeah. No, it was it was fine. It was just a. I mean, politics b- were brought up a couple times. Um, but you managed. I managed. I managed. I'm here. I'm here. We're good. Uh, did you keep a journal? I did not keep a journal. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> hey, out of the two things, you did one of them, which was kept a journal. Out of the two things, I did one of them, which was talk politics. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, we make We're two even. beans in a pod. We're even. Now, uh, did you go out and do any, like, this is a kind of a tech podcast, right, As long, uh, alongside psychology and human factors. Did you go out and do any Black Friday shopping? I didn't go out and do it, because like we talked last time, a little bit of a shut-in when it comes to that. But I did... Hit up Amazon pretty hard. Oh, yeah? yeah Would, I, I got myself, like, a new Rebel camera. Ooh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so I was pretty stoked on that. Maybe, yeah. Well, so we're planning on doing a review show with, uh, you know, after the holidays where we kind of evaluate all the pieces of tech that we have gathered over the last couple of months. Maybe you should do uh, sort of a review, review on that. That would be pretty sick, yeah. I think I think that's that's good. No, I um, I did some Black Friday shopping as well. Uh, and I got some uh, awesome stuff for my parents, and but they they listen to the podcast, so I I can't say what. Oh, that's awesome! You're a dope son. Uh, and I I got them some pretty cool stuff. Uh oh, some pretty cool stuff. Like I'm very excited to nice. to to. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe we'll talk about that uh, after the holidays are over as well. Oh, we should for sure. Yeah. The um, do you see this? The hot item was the 4K TV. Yeah, I was hoping that like one of you guys, like you or Billy, copped a 4K TV. No, I thought about it because they were not that expensive. No, they, they yeah, they were really you could get reasonably like a 40 priced. inch for like less than 300 bucks or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, last year, I, I I told this story a couple times on the show, but last year we got we got a new TV and it was just too soon for us to, you know, return to, you know, like are we going to put this 50 inch TV in our bedroom? Like what? hang it on the ceiling, my <laughs> right? man. There you go. Well, then I'd be afraid of it like falling. Oh right? yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, so um, Blake, you're gonna take Billy's role today and help us move along. I'm so gonna try my best. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> no one can ever replace Billy, but hopefully, you know, you'll at least hold down the fort with us today, um, and and you know, you'll still provide uh, that human factors perspective as well. So, what are we talking about today? So it seems like you're gonna be Billy now, but we're talking about theme parks and human factors. Oh, 
Well, that was Billy. No. <laughs> <laughs> Bird. Okay, well, so we're off to a great start. Yes, uh, theme park human factors. Yeah. yeah. So, all right, Nick. So we were talking about this a little bit earlier. When was, when was the last time you went to a theme park and which one was it? Oh, man. So I, so over, uh, I guess it would have been last month. I, it's still November. Yes, so last month. October, November. Yes, last month <laughs> I went to uh, several theme parks in the span of two days, which is w- what sort of spawned the idea for this episode. Um, and and uh, we went and did all of the uh, the uh, the scary stuff. Oh right? yeah, because this was kind of in concert with like the Halloween season. Yeah, and all yeah, that. yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, like a huge disclaimer for any of our listeners: we are based in Southern California, and so a lot of our analysis and examples are going to be limited to the region, just because of you know it's what we've been exposed to, and we haven't been outside really. I mean, we may have been somewhere else sometime, but uh, it's going to be predominantly. The examples like like Disneyland or or Six Flags Magic Mountain or you know those kind of things. Yeah, but for sure, if you've got like different parts of the world or even parts of the country that you've been to parks, like let us know. We'd yeah, love to look yeah, into yeah. it. We would love to hear your stories. We actually got a couple really great stories uh, from you guys, and just so you guys know, yes, we are receiving your feedback, and we will get to those episode ideas. I know there's. There's a couple people out there who have sent us their episode ideas and they've sent us back saying, hey, where are those episodes? you said they were going to happen. They're coming. They are coming. They are coming. We have a lot of interesting, really cool stuff on the horizon uh, for Human Factors Cast. So, you know, we'll take our time. We'll get there. I promise they'll be covered. Um, so we were talking about what theme parks you've been to. Yeah. What, what about you, Blake? What What was your... So, like, I I've, I grew up, like, going to Disney World in Florida because I grew up in the South. And so when I went to – came out here, uh, me and my girlfriend had gone to Disneyland a few times. Okay. And, like, part of the next question is, what was your favorite experience? And we, we get a little bit more into that as the episode goes on. But I went around Halloween time like you did. Oh, okay. And, you know, Disneyland is so sick at Halloween time. There's just mad decorations everywhere. They've got, like, jack lantern pumpkins carved as different characters and yeah. all that kind of cool stuff. Yeah, I actually went to Disneyland was one of the few that I did go to during um, the sort of uh, the the Halloween season. Although I didn't, it was it was weird because we were only there during the day. Uh, we have a friend that signed us in, so <laughs> we, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we we were only there for a couple hours, um, just kind of hanging out until one of the other theme parks, not S- Scary Farm, uh, appropriately themed for the Halloween season, opened up. Um, but, but what was your favorite experience when you went to Disneyland? Uh, so it had to be just the Halloween decorations, man. Like it, it, I had been there before, like when I first came to California and it was like, all right, it's kind of like Disney world. Cause that's what I was originally right. used to, but then going at like Halloween time and how they deck out the haunted mansion, they change it up a little bit. It's a whole new ball game when you see, you know, that they have, <clears throat> they've decked out the entire park into something different. I mean, like the amount of detail it goes into those kind of things, right? Yeah, and I've totally got a bias towards it because I love like fall and I like Halloween oh, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so my favorite experience, uh, has, I mean, it's not hard to guess. Star Tours, duh. I, I oh Star- yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, anytime you can put me into my favorite franchise, which I guess no, uh, I'm not going to say anything. We're not ready to announce just quite yet, but we do have some exciting Star Wars news uh, coming up. So stay tuned for that. I was going to mention that later. Sneaky. I think that's sneaky. I know. That's a little. That's a little tease. We do have some Star Wars news coming up uh, in the next couple weeks. So so stay tuned for that. Um, but yeah, anytime I can be sort of uh, immersed in my favorite uh, IP intellectual property it's uh it's weird because we don't have billy here so <laughs> he, he can't he can't be the voice of the everyman and be like what's that uh no so intellectual property I, I anytime i can be into my favorite world like that's cool to me and with star wars land on the horizon oh man oh yeah so i mean it's always super epic when they just bring you in for the full experience Right. Uh, so let's let's back up a little bit and talk about the beginning experience when you go to a park, right? So this is like they once you even get there, they're building the anticipation in you. Right. Yeah. So so from the second you start parking, even before you start parking, like you are seeing everything, right? Like you go to downtown Anaheim and things are 
Mickey and Friends themed. Like you see Disney. Anaheim is the city of Disney. Yeah, right? it's, it's like, like you're not even in the park yet, and you can just feel right, it and see it from outside. Right, it's or, so cool. or or you know other other places uh, like uh, roller any place with a roller coaster might have billboards up. Like, hey, come visit us. You can see the roller coasters from far away. You're already getting excited. It's building this anticipation, right? You're seeing, you know, and then you get into the parking lot, and you know, we talked about the same sort of principle with the black Friday sales, right? Like you build that anticipation to get them ready. Yeah. You're, you're making people wait. You're having them kind of stand around for a while, but you know, the craziest thing to me and actually somebody else pointed this out to me when I was at like Disneyland or previously is their ability to control crowds. Yeah. Like for, cause I mean, we talk a little, you talk a little bit in the notes about parking lots and they even like funnel you in from as soon as you get there. Yeah. And, and the interesting with par- thing with parking lots and, and I, uh, I, I mean, I'm not surprised, but just, I guess I didn't really think about it until we did the research for this episode, right? Like some of the things they do is they design the parking lots to make it the least amount of distance that you have to walk to get to the park. Right. So no matter what level you're on, it's just an escalator. No matter, um, you know, where you park, there's a tram somewhere nearby that you just walk to. So they're making it easy for you to get into the park. That easy entry, you know, once you're there, you're there, right? It's <clears throat> It was one of those things that I was like, wow, I didn't even think about that until, you know, I read about it. Yeah, I never would have guessed that. But it makes sense because it's like you're, you want people to save all that energy they have for when they're actually in the park, stuff like that. Right, right, right. You know. And yeah, so it all comes back to those marginal differences that you can, you can just get to it no matter where you park. That's that, that was cool to me, and you know, it's taking that stress out of parking, like you said, you know, it, it helps them save that energy for inside the park. You know, it keeps them at ease, doesn't start them off on the wrong foot, and that's you know, first impressions are like a huge thing, right? Oh, for sure, yeah. So one one other thing that kind of like brings you in is just like the customer experience, even when you're buying tickets. Yeah. So even further before you like even come to the park, I guess. Well, I guess it depends on who you are, right? So, um, so if you're like me, and I, I would guess you too, you probably buy your tickets online. Oh yeah, because it's always just like there's deals going on. Because I'm sucked into like their email campaign, so I I get like things from disney or things from six flags yeah no it totally (laughs) works it's like an e-commerce just hack or whatever yeah i mean so a lot of theme parks will do this thing where they offer you discounts like you know even if it's like 10 bucks for buying online ahead of time for a specific day this does a couple things for them so this one informs them of how many people are we going to get at the park on this day you know how how do we staff this which is also really important, you know, because you, you want a certain percentage of staff to park guests, right? And that's that's cool. But they also, from the user perspective, they they want it to be easy as easy as possible. You don't want to get there. You don't want to have, they don't want you to have to wait in line because lines suck, right? And we'll talk about lines later when it comes to the rides. But they don't want you to have to sort of sit there and wait in line to get your ticket. It's all about that first impression. You want to get there, you want to hand them your ticket, and you want to get in. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to just start it off really bad or anything like that. And it makes sense. Like, uh, it's awesome that they thought far enough ahead to like have you purchase online, then they can take a guess at what they need staff wise. Right. So, I thought it was cool. Guys. Yeah, and I, you know, they have full teams devoted to how easy it is to buy tickets on your website. I mean, you know, it it just comes down to like buy a ticket, one button, like I'm in, good to go. So we, when you go to a theme park, you kind of go there for a certain atmosphere. So Nick, what it, what is a, what are the characteristics of a good theme park atmosphere? So, uh, well, for me, and and you might disagree, but for me, it's it's sort of keeping that magic. Or uh, I mean, and it's hard to not think about Disneyland with it because it's a prime example, right? And I think this was one of Walt's uh, sort of prime directives, if you will, when he was creating the park, is he wanted you to have this sense of escapism he wanted you to come to the park and not think about anything that's outside of the park right so so hiding the outside world 
Oh, yeah. I mean, that makes sense because even if you like, okay, so Disneyland's kind of my only point of reference, right? Because I haven't been to a lot of the other parks in California. We, we got to get you. Man. I know. We got to fix that for sure. Oh, we got to fix that. But I mean, all the bright colors. I mean, that's already trying to build a sense of like hitting your pleasure systems in your brain. You're coming in, you're seeing like fictional characters that you either grew up with or you've seen right. before. So it's really just getting this like euphoric experience already. Right. It, it's invoking nostalgia in some cases. Like, oh, yeah, I remember that. That's that's my childhood or you know whatever it may be it it is literally just sucking everything out of you oh yeah in the best way possible um but yeah that that sort of um i i want to talk about this this little this uh enclosure sort of uh concept a little bit more too so so you know it's easy when you're in the park to not see the outside world right you're you're transported to another place i will say though that there are some theme parks that have um, sort of an, an inherent uh, disadvantage when it comes to this. So what do you mean? You're talking kind of like the immersion in the park? Yeah. So so think about parks with roller coasters. Mm-hmm. What happens when you go up that first hill? Me personally? Well, no. I just start freaking out because well, those roller coasters are huge. There's that. But <laughs> what do you see? Just a uh, roller coaster frames themselves. Well, if you look out to the sides, you see the parking lot. You see the McDonald's down the street. You see things that you, you know, that are not part of the theme park. And they that's don't, really interesting. I've never thought of it that way. And they don't control that, right? They can't. They can't yeah. control who buys property near them. I mean, they can to some degree if you're Disney. But I mean, think about that. So, so you know, if you're in Disneyland, and think about the design of the rides in. In certain, like it's hard to not come back to Disney, but like think about Disney rides. Not one of them shows you the outside world. The closest thing is maybe the Ferris wheel in uh, in the California Adventure, right? You might, yeah, or maybe Tower of Terror if you might be able to. But even Tower of Terror looks over like downtown Disney, so it's it's kind of yeah. And you're only like seeing a horizon. You're not being influenced by something outside, like you mentioned McDonald's or whatever is going on right, in the outside right. world. Right. So so that's that's. I thought that was really interesting, um, just in terms of like, a, and I mean, it, maybe it's less important with with uh, theme parks that have roller coasters because the second you go down that hill, you're not focused on what's on the no. outside; you're just focused on what's coming next. I'm focused on I'm gonna make it to the end. <laughs> Speaking of what's coming next, what's coming next? <laughs> All right, so let's talk about rides. So, Nick, what's your favorite ride at any of the parks you've been to? Oh, I already talked about it, but Star Tours. Star Tours, um, just because favorite IP again, and I mean, you know, I get to go on an adventure with C-3PO, and I love that they change it up every time. It's almost like they personalized it, but not really. It's randomized, so you have to come back and ride it multiple times. I still haven't done Jakku, but I've done everything else. It was really fun. Okay, so I'm going to go, like, on a little rant here, but... uh, Let's do it. um, So it had been a long time since I had gone to Disneyland, and... When I first met my partner, we went to Disneyland and, you know, we, we bonded over Star Wars. It was kind of our thing. And then so we, we went there and uh, we decided we were going to ride Star Tours until we've experienced not necessarily all the permutations because that's like 54, but all the scenes available, right? So there's like three scenes that you start out with, then there's three or there's two scenes that you start out with then there's three scenes that follow that and then there's two scenes that follow that and then there's three scenes that follow that i love that you know the sequence of the scenes you could yes. possibly see so so there the minimum amount of rides that you have to do is three right because if you do a a a a and then a b b b and then b c b c if you're thinking about options. <laughs> yeah, you're hitting all the permutations. That makes, yeah, <laughs> you are, makes you sense. are hitting all of them. And we did it. We did it in three tries. You we did it in three tries? Three tries. What? The bare minimum. It was so serendipitous. It was it was awesome. That's pretty epic. So man. forever that will be etched in my mind. And and then since they added this new one for the Force Awakens, like every time I've gone back, I haven't been able to get it. It's so frustrating. Oh, I didn't even know they added a new yeah, one for that. They, yeah, they added a new one and they'll add a new one for episode eight and they'll keep adding them. That's it's pretty that's cool. Perfect. Uh, what about you? What's your favorite ride? Uh, so this is like back to tying to Halloween. So my favorite one is Haunted Mansion, especially oh, at that time of year. And I so think the good. part that I like the most is like, of course, it's based around Halloween stuff, ghosts and all that kind of silliness. But I really like that the technology still kind of stands up today. Like even the holographics they use and like the different floating mechanisms for headless stuff. Like oh, it's yeah. Just, it's just perfect. 
it's yeah that Disney magic is something. It's something, something else. else. Like those Imagineers, even back when that was first built, oh, like, yeah. that's just some epic you, stuff. You made. have to like, especially with technology now, you had to put yourself in in you know that time and just go, wow, that would blow your mind if you saw that. Well, the funny thing is, is we knew less about the human mind back then, but we were able to trick it still to such oh, a yeah. large degree. So that's yeah. definitely my favorite ride and favorite experience. Oh yeah, tricking the human mind is great. I, all right, it's it's what we're all about. Yeah, so so of course we're gonna come back to lines because this is just a an insane kind of psychology thing. Oh yeah. So lines. let's talk about a crazy experience you had. It, like if it was Black Friday or a new console release or any even at a ride at a park. So uh, my well, oh, this is just gonna be a Star Wars podcast now. Uh, <laughs> my longest line and the uh, yeah I know right. Um, my longest line and my favorite line to wait in was the panel for the force awakens at star Wars celebration Anaheim. So we got in line around 12 o'clock at night. Uh, so midnight and we waited there until like 9am. But when we got to sit down, we were 50 feet away from JJ Abrams, Kathleen Kennedy, Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, um, Peter Mayhew, Daisy Ridley, John Biega, Oscar Isaac, like the entire cast of the force awakens Whoa. minus Harrison Ford. Was up there. Bummer. Well, he was. He got injured. Yeah. Otherwise, he would have been up there too. But it was just. And then the energy in that room was just phenomenal. It was worth the wait. What about you? What's your what? What's like your longest line or favorite line or whatever like line that you've been in? So my favorite one, and I'll never forget this. Uh, what it was a of course Disneyland. Sorry guys again. Uh, but it was for like the Indiana Jones ride or okay. something like that. And we were. I was with my girlfriend and her best friend and his wife. And it was just a obscene line. Like, there was a bunch of people. Everybody in the line just looked so mad, so pissed. Just, it was hot outside. But we are just oh, sitting yeah. there laughing, having a good time, because we were playing, like, it's a game on your phone. It's got, like, heads up. Oh, is that the one where you, like, guess what's on the forehead? Yeah, what's oh. on your forehead. That's what it's called. Dude, we must have played that for at least two hours straight. And <laughs> it was the best line experience I think I'd ever had. Now... Why are we talking about lines? So we're talking about lines because you have to wait in line, like you said, for rides, right? Yeah, so we're, we want to know what makes a good line. Right, and I mean, you know, it sucks because theme parks can't accommodate all 25,000 park guests at once, right? So you have to at least put them in some sort of line to mitigate this. I, I, I mean, you know, they, they, they have some sort of tools in their toolbox so so you asked what makes a good line right and there's a lot of research on lines in particular um the individual queue line so this is what you would find like at a at a shopping uh at, at any retail store like you you go to the store and you see oh there's like less people on line seven i'm gonna go strategically go over to line seven and i get this rush of beating out you know everybody else that was on eight through twelve you know, because it took me less time, I waited less time, and I got in and out faster than you guys did. Yeah. So there's this rush. But you can't necessarily do that in a theme park, oftentimes because it's one coaster or, um, you know, one unit that everybody has to file into. Or even the fact that there's just a sheer volume of people. Yeah, like you wouldn't even be able to discern which line is quicker in that instance, right? So there's this combined queue line. Uh, which which you some retailers actually use this too, where everybody stands in the same line, and then the next available thing you go to right. So I think like TJ Maxx has this or um, Home Goods or something where you go in and you all stand in the same line, and then or, or Fry's Electronics has this too where you 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 know the next next available like, one you have like just call multiple you down. possibilities yeah yeah gotcha and it, it it goes faster but you all have to wait the same amount of time. Yeah, so, I mean, that creates that sense of equality, right? Like, you think you're right. all waiting the same amount of time. Right, and and so, you know, there's then there's also this cool thing that theme parks do. Uh, it's known as fast pass or quick pass, or, you know, it's known as different things across different parks, but um, this is one way that I thought was really interesting design-wise how they mitigate these lines, right? So, basically, what they do is they employ this fast pass system that allows users to skip the line or stand in some sort of truncated line, right? Um, that basically they use their ticket to return to it later. And 
the reason that this is fair is because they only give you a certain allowance, right? Like you get one fast pass per hour. Yeah, that's right. You only get them every certain amount of time. And so people aren't super upset because, you know, it's not like everybody can use them on every ride. It's like you have to pick and choose which rides you want to use this on. And so everybody kind of has that mutual sort of understanding like, oh, I understand these people use their tickets to get ahead of me on this ride. That's fine. Right. And they often hide it from the other folks, too. Right. Like you'll have them around the corner and then the fast pass line is off to the side. Come out of nowhere. Come on, come on. Get in. Right. And then so so they hide it. So, I mean, you don't get that rush. Right. Um, in the regular line. But you do get that rush when you use the fast pass because you look at that line and you go, ha, I don't have to wait in that. That's very true, yeah. And right? there's, like, even kind of a, a science or a way to hack it throughout the day. So you just, like, if you know there's something you really want to go on, but it'll be crowded. Right, crowded, yeah. Pass, pass, go hit a bunch of other yeah. rides, come back in a couple it's, hours. It's almost come back to that gamification thing, right? Like, you can gamify this by saying, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna pick strategically this ride because I know it'll be a pain to get on later. Just giving people that rush. Yeah, so we're talking about rides. Uh, what, what's coming up next year? So what what makes a ride thrilling to you? Um, so we talked a little bit about this in a couple episodes. Uh, this is, this is a callback to our PlayStation VR episode when we talked about, um, what was it? Until Dawn, Rush of Blood. And then we also talked about this in our Psychology of Fear episode. Um, but yeah, adrenaline, fear, and excitement are three sort of pillars for me that makes a roller coaster exciting or, or just a ride exciting. What about you? So it's kind of interesting. So I'm not the biggest roller coaster fan or any of that kind of stuff, but I was reading something earlier about how like that that almost near death experience that you can get gives you some sort of pleasure in your brain. And it makes sense because I remember the first time I rode Tower of Terror and the only time. <laughs> the, <laughs> never again. I uh like Well, it, let's it, have a moment of silence for Tower of Terror because they're Oh, mad bummer too, right? Like yeah. that's a legacy thing. It is. Let's just... Okay. You will be missed Tower of Terror. 100%, even we though don't... you made me almost cry. Oh man, no, I'm sorry. It was awesome. Uh but yeah, it was I remember being on the ride with like a bunch of my friends and just freaking out cuz you're like getting all the just like this rush or whatever. But getting off, I remember this like strange euphoria. And it's just, it's hitting those pleasure Legs centers. Legs wobbly. Brain. Yeah, you're just like, oh my goodness, I made it. I made it, I'm alive. Yeah, I mean, they, they, these uh, roller coasters, in, you know, in particular, are designed to maximize that fear, right? They, they're designed to, like you said, bring you to the edge of death in the most safe way possible. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I know, and it, it's kind of weird that we just get a kick out of that. Right, yeah, I know it is, right? And so, like, think about, and then another piece of it is, like, think about that anticipation that you experience as you're going up the hill, right? You're looking at the McDonald's down the road. You're looking at the parking lot. You're seeing outside. It's just, like, click, 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 click. It's almost like a um, a countdown to your doom, right? And it's, like, you know that once you hit that thing, it's literally all downhill from there. <laughs> so, I mean, they even build expectation to you because you expect that you're going to get on a roller coaster and you're going to have that click, click, click. But I remember I'd never been to California Adventures, and I got on California Screaming, and oh, it man. just like shoots right oh, off. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was just like, what? There's no buildup at all. It's like, oh, we're doing this. Okay, let's go. Here we go. <laughs> and I mean, that kind of brings us to the next point. So talking about harnesses and lap bars. So I'm oh, assuming yeah. we want to get into like maybe the ergonomics or why they're built the way they are. Yeah, so these, these are cool. So um, I was thinking about this a lot. So when I went to uh, Knott's Berry Farm, uh, last month. Yeah, it's still last month. Wow. That is, yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, it feels like forever ago. Uh, yeah. When I was sitting there, I was like, why do some rides have harnesses and why do some have lap bars? Right. And I was thinking about this and then I, you know, went and re researched it for the show. So apparently harnesses are used on more quote unquote violent roller coasters where you're maybe doing corkscrews, unsafe maneuvers that, you know, a, a lap bar couldn't typically hold like, not, it's less about holding you in and more about stabilizing your head. They don't want to give you whiplash. They don't want, you know, it, it's it's more about keeping your upper body stable uh, because they don't want it flailing all around. Yeah, because you want to keep that neck in a good position, especially if you're flipping upside down and doing really hard turns. Oh, yeah. All that yeah. Kind of stuff. Yeah, and then lap bars are kind of used as the bare minimum, right? Like they're, they're just like, well, here you go. 
Um, Hold on. You know, users users have more movement, but it also sort of gives you that sort of sense of fear and excitement because that's literally the only thing that's holding you in. That's true. Yeah. There's, right? there's a couple rides at Disney that are like the, I don't know, they're, they're little roller coasters or whatever. I think one's like Thunder Mountain, but I yeah. can like barely fit in the box with oh, the yeah. lap bar. That's, that's really scary. <laughs> yeah, when it like, freaks me out because yeah. I'm like, I'm going to go flying out of this thing, or, uh, lap oh, bar or no. There's one, um, there's one at Six Flags. I, I think it's like Riddler's Revenge or something, but you it's a stand-up coaster. And stand-up ones always get me because it's like, what if I accidentally, you know, bend my knees while, when it locks? Then I'm like, I'm my knees are bent and it's like pushing me down. Oh yeah. And then like, I won't have the strength to keep my body up and I'll just slip out the bottom or, um, you know, or like it, I, I see this all the time and I'm like, why are you doing that? But people will jump up and down while it's trying to lock and, <laughs> and then it'll That's lock. That's a silly higher. idea. It's, it's just stupid. Like, I don't wonder, maybe they're just trying to elicit more fear. Yeah. And they go, wait, 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 wait. And it's, it's I gone. Need the more then, rush. <laughs> It's just that's too crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's too much. That's too much for me. So, what are some other like additional experiences you have at some of these theme parks that you enjoy? So, when I was at Disneyland most recently, uh, I discovered there was a companion app, um, and uh, I totally just jumped the gun on our show notes. I it's skipped over like three of them, but let's talk about companion apps because this one was cool, and it f- kind of feeds into the next one. Cool, but companion apps. So. Disneyland has this app that allows you to keep all of your pictures from the ride sort of in one place, right? So so you, you get off the ride, and they usually snap a picture of you with a scared face or whatever. You come off the ride. You see a little number in the bottom corner, and you just type that number into your phone and the app, and then it saves it. Oh, that's cool. And, you know, if, if you're, like, a member or whatever, it'll give you the picture for free. If you are not a member, it'll show you the picture with a watermark so you can't use it, whatever. But I thought that was cool because then you just you just look at the number and be like, okay, there it is. I'm going to save it. And then you can post it on Facebook. You can post it on Twitter, whatever. That is pretty I sick. thought it was pretty cool. I Actually, I think I remember using that the last time I was there about a year ago. But it, w- it wasn't for that particular purpose. It was more for trying to figure out how long lines were. Yeah, so that was a feature of it too. And it's almost like an interactive map in that sense, right? It'll tell you like where the where you are in the place in the park it'll also tell you you know where the nearest restrooms are what food you can get nearby what rides are nearby how long the wait times are i thought it was really cool because it it incorporates all these elements that you know the park goer needs it's all about catering to the user needs well it makes it a little easier too because you're not like carrying around pieces of paper or like i don't know i get Whenever I go, I'm like there for the whole day, so I'm super tired at some point and can't really even think. So if it right. helps me like figure out line times or where oh, to yeah. go next, it's it's sick. Oh yeah. So we talked about photos. Let's back it up a little bit. Let's talk about photos here, right? Now a lot of theme parks will allow you to take photos with like your favorite characters, or you know, it has a lot of photo op opportunities. Um, and uh, you know, the interesting thing about photos is that they serve as memory aids. Oh, yeah, they can even be, like, heavy memory influencers. Do you have any pictures of you as a kid at Disney World um, right next to Mickey Mouse or somebody else? Oh, yeah. i got a good few of them, I'm Do you sure. remember that? Oh, no. Yeah, no, no, no. but you do now because you see it, right? Yeah, it, like, implants that memory for you. So let's talk about memory for a sec, because this is really interesting, right? So memory is malleable, right? So... Be careful what you take pictures of or else you might remember incorrectly, especially. And this happens a lot when you're like at a party and you're trying to glorify what the party's like. Right. And everyone's just having a good time. It might not be like that, but let's all pose for a picture. You know, it, there's this whole thing when you take sort of uh, sort of pictures. It it does Im- implement these uh, or implant these um, false memories. And there was an interesting study. Uh, called Bugs Buddy, Bugs Bunny invades Disneyland. Oh man! So this is interesting, right? Because oh, this Bugs, is a Loftus study. I remember having yeah. to like, gruel over a lot of his papers in grad yeah. school. <laughs> so, so this is this is interesting too, um, because Bugs Bunny is not a Disney IP, intellectual right? property. In a, there you go. Yeah. So, so basically, in this study, they got 120 people and told them that they're going to participate in an, an ad evaluation program. Um, and basically what they did was they, you know, pulled aside people who were attending Disneyland or Disney world. And, uh, you know, the, the people 
said that they were working for Disney, the, these researchers, and they weren't. So they just wanted to find out, you know, if they could toy basically with somebody else's memories. Oh, so, that's real nice. Yeah, it's real nice of them, right? As psychologists, uh, I know Billy would insert a comment about us being um, wizards and such. wizards and you know messing, you know, mind control now. Really? Okay. So I we miss you, Billy. Yeah, we do. Come back, come back next week. Um, yeah. So so they were basically divided into four groups and the way they divided these out was uh, we talked about methods last week a little bit and I got pretty upset about some of the methods, but I thought these were sound. So basically what they did was they uh, had the first group read an ad about the theme park. No mention of characters at all, right? The second group read the same ad, but in the room with them, there was a four foot tall cutout of Bugs Bunny. That's not weird. Nope. In the third group, uh, which the researchers refer to as the Bugs Group, had a ad. They they had them read an ad about Disneyland and Bugs Bunny. All right. right. Bugs Bunny was at Disneyland. Then the fourth group was the double whammy. They had the Bugs ad and the stand-up of Bugs in the room, right? So after reading through this ad, which uh, featured a picture of Bugs just outside the Magic Kingdom, which is a Disneyland, Disney World, Right. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Disney World. Um, so the participants were asked whether or not they had met Bugs on a visit to the theme park, and whether they had shaken his hand. Oh man! So <laughs> here's the funny thing: a third of the participants who had read the phony ad featuring Bugs said they either remembered or knew they had, in, or at least knew that they had indeed met Bugs at Disneyland. Really? I, yeah. I mean, that's just how influenceable your memory can be. Which yeah. is just super interesting. Yeah, and I mean, again, Bugs Bunny wouldn't be caught dead at Disneyland. Like, this is... I don't know if he's loud in there. No! <laughs> Mickey's like, uh-uh, uh-uh. Or, sorry, ah, uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> That was my poorly done Mickey Mouse. No, but, I mean, that's astonishing to me. 33% of people, right, uh, just off this simple suggestion, had their memories altered. Well, I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense because this is not related completely to this idea. But, I mean, there's, like, the whole problem with eyewitness testimony, which a good cognitive science friend of ours, I do believe she studied a good bit of that in right. grad school. And I mean, I don't know. Memory memory is a dangerous thing when you have to recall it, especially if, like, a lot of time oh, yeah. has passed or if people have been I- talking to you per ti- potentially influencing how you're going to feel about it. I mean, oh, yeah. just like inserted Bugs Bunny into Disneyland. Right. So it's, it's I don't know. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that eyewitness testimony would be a great episode idea too. Yes, it would. Can we write that down? Let's write that down. It's coming. Yeah. Um, so let's see here. So yeah, we we're talking about pictures. So uh, why, why does this happen? Um, why are pictures at theme parks? You know, why does this happen? Right. So you have, uh, there are studies also that suggest that, you know, taking a picture gives our brain sort of this free pass. Okay, I've taken the picture. I don't have to remember it. It's that whole knowledge in the world versus knowledge in the head thing that you that you get in human factors and user experience design, right? It's um you want to design it to where the most information for the user is on the interface in the appropriate manner. Yeah, because you want to kind of, for lack of a better analogy, clear the memory. A little bit, kind of right. like if you were a CPU, you want to give yourself as much space as possible. As much RAM, yeah. yeah. You want, yeah, you the, you want the mind to process it as as efficiently as you can, and all that extra clutter. If you can take a picture of something and remember it, that's much more efficient than trying to you know commit it to memory. Oh yeah. So that whole thing influences you know how sort of you misremember these things. Um. So yeah, that, that was interesting. What about uh, what's next? So. This is one of my favorite parts of going to. <laughs> this is not one of my parks. favorite parts. No, oh no. man. Well, I mean, the fact that you get to get food, I guess. Oh uh, well, but yeah, I, yeah, it depends. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so food prices always blow me away at parks. But why do you think people oh. even pay that amount of money? Because we all know that they mark it up really high. Yeah. Well. Have you ever paid $7 for a drink at Disneyland? Oh, you know I have, and it was water, too, and even <sighs> soda. I know. It's the worst. It's the worst. But, I mean, they trap you. They trap you in the park. Where else are you going to go? Yeah, you're going to leave, which is going to take I mean, however long yeah. to get back to the front, get to your car, leave, and then try and come back. I yeah. don't think so. It's just yeah, no, not get your happen. hand stamped, get the car, leave, pay for parking again. Yeah, they, they have got you. 
they might have engineered joy, but they were also looking to make some serious money off of us. Oh holes. yeah, and in fact, they actually did research on you know the optimal price. Like, mm, how much will people pay for this? What's too much? Yeah, what is too much to where we're not making as much money? They have found that optimal zone. I wish I had stats here on that optimal zone, but I think it's like. I think it's something like four seventy five for a, a large soda or for like a, a regular soda. Just enough to make you mad but not make you not do it. Yeah, exactly. It's like, eh, well, I'm here. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you kind of just have to accept it at that point because, I don't know, you paid all that money to go to Disneyland or whatever park you wanted to go to. You're probably not going to leave till the end of the day. Right, right. I mean, you know, even in most cases or in some cases where they'll let you into the park with food, which most places won't. Like, that's – no. Don't even don't even come to our gates. We'll take it. We'll eat it for our lunch. That's that's not that's not yours anymore. Um, but you know, even in even in places that have that, most people don't even plan for that type of thing. Like, oh it's, no, it's not something that you think about until you're there, right? It's a what is the term? A captive audience or a captive um, captive audience is close, but uh, it's it's basically like we got gotcha. you. You you can't do anything else. And I mean. There is no escape. Most people just accept it, you know. And and like I said earlier, they've done that research on the pricing, and that's just, ugh. All right. So is that it? So it looks like we've kind of hit the end of it here. Oh, man. That was a short episode. For sure, yeah. Well, if you guys have any sort of theme park stories that you want to share with us, let us know. Uh, we are more than happy to take those, and we'll read them on the show Man, well, wow. It's a little bit shorter of an episode today, but it was a fun one. Oh, I yeah. Would say. You know, I think it's because Billy isn't here. I think if Billy was here, he would have a lot to say about theme parks. I think so, too. I'm kind of a bummer because <laughs> I've only been to one. That's okay. It's okay. What did you guys think, though? Did we miss a theme park uh, concept that you guys want to hear about? Let us know. Um, you know, if you want to be featured on our show, we're all over that social media. Go ahead and comment on our SoundCloud, Facebook, Twitter, can send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com with all your questions, comments, and stories. Like I said earlier, we love hearing your stories and feedback. You can also get to the front of the question line by supporting us on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and review us on iTunes, Google Play Store, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast directory. We're always trying to keep in touch with you guys our listeners and what you want to hear about on the show so feel free to suggest a way i want to thank mr blake arnsdorf for being my co-host on the show today blake where can our listeners find you it's always good to be here guys you can find me on twitter at ux chill bro as always i've been your host nick rome you can find me on linkedin or twitter at nick underscore rome thanks again for tuning into human factors cast until next time it, it depends, depends.